Excelsior He'd put me in the cage The diver's cage he had It was a cage from his days as a diver And he forced me into the cage Into the pond with the trout He'd put the trout in the cage as well and the cage had been chewed by sharks, attracted to the electromagnetized metal when it had been in seawater. And I was the burlying, the chumming, the bait in the buoyant water. I was there, just there, just something. And I almost drowning excited him the water swallowed my shrieks as i thrashed around to free myself the mirror carps ghost carps rods and trenches all around and him him the shark always a shark and i was all that he wanted and he liked me there just like the prey, just like something for the sharks. Seeing me almost drowning excited him so much. And the fish just watched. They were the merv wires excited. And the pond water moving around me. Tugging me, pulling me felt safer than the coarse river it moved with force like him he was stocked with rainbow trout and brown trout of all sizes and he would tell me their names with his lips against mine him like a shark biting my kiss he'd name them he'd tell me their name my kiss uncle hankus my kiss rainbow trout I did not know the beautiful river attracted artists and tourists and trout fishermen, but he banned them all, but never banned me, and I used to enjoy his hands on my throat there under the lake, under the river, in that cage. Yes, his hands tight around my neck, and he made love to me in the river his hair and his body just as smooth and hard and intentional like a shark's with his fingers round my throat squeezing the trachea squeezing out all the breath squeezing with those hard, cold hands. And I used to enjoy that. I came to enjoy his hands on my throat as he loved me there under the river. No one around, anyone watching. Well, they'd see nothing. We were almost invisible blending into the water like sea ghosts and him his hair and body green from the moonlit vegetation resembled the water spirit of Odianoi if those green things were attractive he was on my back I was his back back a Haston brook horse he wanted to stay on getting off by ne never getting off me I could drown him if I wanted to, but I would never drown him like the brook horse, Thurkirsten. I did not want to drown him, even though I was drowning. I fought the water currents. All the bitch water spirits had dragged extra gallons of water with them to confound me. I kicked at the currents, trying to scream, while he held me and with his hands on my throat, his fingers on my 
my skin and on the back of my head. I kicked up the current, screaming, Nayads drink up, let water pour into their mouths. Yes, let these spirits that were trying to drown me. Mm, please, don't drown me. Not yet. Not yet. Although he liked it. He liked that feeling of me under his hands, with his hands on my throat, feeling me drowning, 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 just fighting, and me wishing naiads drink up, let water pour into their mouths, into the water spirits and their lungs and drown them all, drown the water spirits, drown them, oh cry nay I, drink fountains, Oh, Limnades, drink lakes. Oh, Pagei, drink springs. Oh, Potamades, drink rivers. Oh, Elea, oh, Mome, drink the marshes. Leave me to drink my man's kisses. I was not a strong swimmer. I could not hold my breath underwater, not for long. Not the way he could, with his greater lung capacity, I couldn't do that. No, I felt he was holding me down longer, holding me down there much longer each time we went to the river. And he was not saying anything. He did not respond to my struggles. And I was there with his hands on my throat, on my trachea, round my neck, that squeeze. And there was me praying that all the water spirits would drown. While I was enjoying his kisses, that was the only thing the only liquid I wanted to drink. No, I, I learnt to enjoy it, to learn to love what he wanted me to be, despite my fear of the water and swimming. Mm. He was always kind to me when it was time for home. The puddles we left were like water being cast off and we were just us again we were just us and i married him that's what happened and i let him keep his fish and his ponds and we had our first baby a little boy and my man he adored the child adored it he no longer took me to the cage in the pond or the river. He no longer wanted his hands on my throat under the cool, cold pond and river. Get a hobby, he said. So I found a sewing machine and basket and a tui case filled with ginger scissors, thimbles and the like. And I found my sewing encyclopedia, items I'd collected before I had met him, when I was with other men who were never enough for me. And I had found something to keep myself busy, to make myself better, to make better clothes than any boutique or designer. But I never got round to making much. I had been too busy looking for someone who was looking for me. I was not busy now. I'd found my man, but he was too busy, too busy to be loved by me. Well, I had the sewing, and that's what I did. And perhaps I thought I could get my son to love me with the new toys I made for him. And the baby had so many new toys, so many, especially this new teddy bear. He loved teddy bears and the baby was becoming an arctophile. 
and that was somebody who loves bears, loves teddy bears, and I was particularly fond of one. And the baby, he embraced the teddy bear more than me. I thought he would stop loving the toy, the teddy bear. I thought it was just a phase, but the weeks became months and they passed, and he kept his affection for the toy. And I had to change that. I had to make him love me. I had to get that baby to love me. I had to get my man to love me. There had been the three of us, a family, but now I felt it was him and the baby, my man and the baby, and I was not included. I was outside of that little bubble of love. So I was making lovely teddy bears and I made one without a sewing machine. A 25 centimetre tall ba a teddy bear with premium mohair fur and alpaca from the Andes and it moved because it was a fully cotter pin five way jointed bear. It could turn its head in almost any direction because it was on a neck with a double disc neck fastening. I gave the bear the best of everything. I gave it ultra suede paw pads Paw toes, each embroidered paw, airbrush lightly to look real. I gave it a pearl cotton nose and a face that had, oh, an expression that showed a playful nature. And sometimes it just looked glum, but the playful nature was always there. It was always there. I added glass beads for weight. Almost finished, a fine teddy bear, a teddy bear most superior. But the stuffing had to be the best. Yes, Excelsior. The aspen fibre, wood-like shavings. Excelsior was the best stuffing. Night and night passed. The nights came and went. And my men would not hold me. And, and my son would not let me hold him either. My men cradled the baby. And there were nights when the baby would not sleep and he would take the baby, just him and the baby, and they would go by the river or the lake and they would watch. They would watch the waves. They would watch the little creatures. Well, I followed them. And they were going to a beach as well, seal watching. I hid and I watched from behind the rocks, behind the sandy rocks. I observed them. Watch me, I whispered, hoping they'd notice me. And they would sometimes swim. I could not swim. I felt close to the sea. Why was I with that man? After all I had given him. I had become what he wanted, given him what he liked. I learned to like what he wanted. I became what he wanted. And that's, and now I was lying on my stomach, getting into my rubber coat like a selkie, a sea lion woman, finding a skin again, returning to the sea. And I was thinking, leave my husband to pine and die. Leave him, he will pine and die. I wish I could leave him. I don't think I could leave him, I thought, because he would not pine and die for me. He was singing to the child. The sea breeze was a lullaby. I lifted my face to feel it, because it carried the song that had touched his lips that came from him. I ran home. I took the baby's teddy bear. I took the lovely, that lovely little bear. And what I did was, well, what I had to do, I took the baby's bear to the trout hatchery. I took it to the lake, to the river. By morning, hundreds and hundreds of my men's fish were dead. The baby's favourite teddy bear had blocked the oxygen pipe. Yes, 
Yeah, he was usually blocked by clumsy frogs and dead muskrats. The baby so loved by my man was gone. The teddy bear that night had, in addition to the excelsior stuffing, small bones of a baby. Yes, I wanted to add, well, help the baby be close to the bear. Yes, small bones of a baby in the bear. It was easy to make flesh disappear. Bones did not decompose. I took the bear, took the bear, and I set it adrift. I set the bear, I pulled it out of the pipe, and I let the little bear float away. That baby, so loved by my man, that bear, so loved by my baby. Yes. Perhaps, baby, I said, praying into the night, you'll return one night, so follow the fish. Or if you choose not to, just swim to other waterways. You know the salmon never visit their mothers. Learn from them. Learn from them. I pull the cage out of the water, empty. Come back. Come back, unseen. The end.